And good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, Philadelphia Regional Center for Children's Environmental Health uh, Seminar. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sunny Mumford for today's seminar. Sunny is Professor of Epidemiology and Deputy Director of Division of Epidemiology in the Department of Biostatistics, Epidemiology and Informatics, the same department as me. Uh, she is also co-director of Women's Health Clinical Research Center and director of enrichment in the Penn Center of Nutrition Science and Medicine at Permanent School of Medicine at Penn. She received a PhD in epidemiology from UNC Chapel Hill and built a very successful career in nutritional and reproductive epidemiology at the NICHD and now at Penn. Her research is internationally recognized and on modifiable dietary and lifestyle factors in relation to infertility ideology and the treatment, as well as novel methods for reproductive epidemiology research and causal inference. Uh, she received the Brian McMahon uh, Early Career Epidemiology Award from SCR and the Ruth Kirsten uh, Mentoring Award from NIH. She is now leading the Pen Chop Echo cohort with colleagues uh, Heather Boris and Sarah Demar from Chop, and she will talk more about that. Welcome, Sunny. Thank you so much for that introduction. So yeah, I'm really excited to be invited to present today on behalf of our multi-PI team, which includes myself and doctors Heather Burris and Sarah DeMauro. And this talk will kind of take two parts. So the first, the first part will really be looking at what is Pen Shop Echo? What was our motivation for applying for the grant? What are some of the questions that we hope to be able to address? How the study is going so far? How you can get involved? We would love to collaborate with, with all of you. And the second half will kind of focus on different methods and how we can approach some of these questions. Kind of geek out a little bit with my Epi Methods, Epi Methods hat. But our work was really motivated by the fact that health disparities start early in life and they can have lifelong impacts. We see really striking disparities in infant mortality and preterm birth, where infants born to Black and Hispanic mothers, as well as those with lower socioeconomic status, they're more likely to be born preterm. And being born preterm can have lifelong consequences associated with developmental delays, chronic respiratory problems, and so it has a really important impact on families. And we still don't really understand what causes preterm birth and how the environment may contribute to that. And as we think about the many different determinants of health, from purely genetic causes to purely environmental causes, and as we move along this continuum of complex health disorders, we really start to see that the most heterogeneous disorders, things like preterm birth, obesity, asthma, neurodevelopment, the environmental factors are really the major drivers of the disparities that we see. And we know that these exposures, and these environmental exposures in particular, during early life can really set the stage for lifelong health and wellness. So what's happening during these first five years, even preconception, throughout pregnancy, and in early childhood can really have important impacts on long-term health. And there are many aspects of the environment that may matter for health. And I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. And we have kind of conceptualized this as thinking about both the microenvironment, so the individual level factors, what we eat, physical activity, sleep, stress levels, but also the macro environment. So the more neighborhood level factors that an individual may have less control over. And we think of this as both the macro physical environment, so green space, walkability, pollution, temperature, but also the macro social environment. So discrimination, neighborhood deprivation and violence. And there's been a lot of work done on these different factors individually. And we'll talk about some of that and highlight some, some data gaps. So what do we know? So a lot of work has been done in this area, starting to explore these factors 
in relation to pregnancy and child health outcomes in particular. And this work, probably unsurprisingly, shows that disadvantaged neighborhoods are at an increased risk of preterm birth. And this work is usually done looking at overall indices of disadvantage, so looking at area level factors, area level indices of poverty, crime, education. And so we're seeing this association overall, but what's not clear is which aspects are the most important drivers. So we still need to dig into this more so we can understand where we can intervene and really have the most positive impact. There's also been a lot of work done on air pollution and we see that air pollution is varying a lot by neighborhood, tends to be associated with poor outcomes, including an increased risk of preterm birth. But we don't fully understand the mixtures. Air pollution is made up of a various components and we don't fully understand the mechanism or how this might interact with other factors like physical activity, if there are any synergistic effects. And members of our team, including Drs. Heather Burris and Gina South, have done some really incredible work looking at green space, particularly here in Philadelphia. And Heather leads the GeoBirth study, which has looked at proximity to green space and walkability, and found that these are really potentially health promoting factors, that closer proximity to green space, more walkability, tends to be associated with lower risk of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, potentially lower risk of preterm birth. And Dr. South has done some trials showing that improving green space in our neighborhoods here locally is associated with reduced stress. So really providing this mechanism by which green space can affect pregnancy and child health. And what we need to take this the next step further and continue to look at how these exposures are related to child health outcomes. A lot of my work has really focused on the microenvironment side. And we've found that walking during preconception is associated with a lower risk of pregnancy loss. And the various dietary factors are also associated with improved fertility. So things like vitamin D and fruit and vegetable intake. And this work has really pointed to the importance of looking at the preconception period specifically. This time period typically receives much less attention. It's hard to study preconception, but it's a really important critical window of, of development. And there's been a lot of work done on diet and lifestyle during pregnancy. But even still, we've been limited in being able to translate that into specific pregnancy recommendations. So outside of, you know, make sure you take that prenatal vitamin with folic acid, the recommendations for physical activity, sleep, and diet are all basically the same for pregnant and non-pregnant individuals. So we have a lot of work that we can do in this area to really provide good evidence-based guidance. And we don't fully understand how these factors interact. We know that they do, right? We know that our diet and physical activity on one day can influence how we sleep at night, which will then affect our diet and physical activity the next day. But a lot of the research done in this area has tended to look at these factors separately. And so we've done a lot of work on these individual factors, but the combination between the micro and macro environment has not really been studied well. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in this area to understand these associations with pregnancy and child health outcomes. So some examples of thinking about how these micro and macro environments interact, living in an area with more limited food access can impact diet quality. But this really isn't typically considered in studies of dietary intake. And when we're looking at walkability and physical activity, we're rarely considering neighborhood violence or air pollution that could be impacting activity levels. And so these links between the macro and the micro environment are something that we really need to tease apart. And I've only gone over a very small aspect of these micro and macro environments. There is so much that we need to learn about the role of microplastics chemicals, 
you know, the role of the wildfire smoke that we all experienced last summer and how these are related. And this matters on a global level, but also is really important for us here locally. We see on the local level that these environmental exposures are differentially impacting our communities. We see the highest rates of elevated blood lead levels in North and West Philly. And this has been associated with poor neurodevelopment outcomes. And children in Philadelphia have more than two times the national rate of asthma. So really highlighting the potential impact of these environmental factors on our children's health here locally. And with this backdrop in mind, and all these open questions that we need to, we need to really study, we were very excited to be awarded a large grant from the NIH to dig into this, to really look at these environmental influences during critical windows of development, during preconception and pregnancy on child health outcomes. And we're really thrilled that Penn and CHOP were selected to be a part of this effort so that our communities can be represented. And our goal is to enroll 2,500 pregnant individuals to really look at these micro and macro environmental factors on perinatal outcomes, asthma, obesity, neurodevelopment, and well-being in, in the kids. And this is really only made possible by an incredible partnership between Penn and CHOP. So we are recruiting participants and their partners at Hub and Pensy, and then following the kids at CHOP. And one of the unique aspects of this study that I was particularly excited about is that we'll also be studying this postpartum time period. So the women who become pregnant again, we will then be enrolling their second pregnancies and following them. And so we'll be able to capture this interpregnancy or preconception time period for the second pregnancy to really be able to consider the preconception and pregnancy time periods as critical windows of exposure. And Penn and CHOP serve a diverse population. So we see about 9,000 births per year at both Hub and Penn C. And this is really representative of the obstetrical patients in Philadelphia. And these two hospitals actually see over 50% of the total births in Philly. And so we really expect the Penn Shop Echo cohort to be generalizable to the Philadelphia area and to other urban and similarly economic and racially diverse areas of the country. And we're really focused on being able to consider these environmental factors and disparities in these outcomes. And ACOG, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, other professional organizations and advocacy groups have really stressed the importance of addressing these disparities in maternal morbidity and mortality and obstetric outcomes. And so there's really an urgency to include diverse populations including Black participants in observational studies and clinical trials. And so in response to this need, the Penn Pregnancy and Perinatal Research Center, the research program implemented these equity dashboards in 2021, where each study is reviewed quarterly to make sure that there's really equitable participation of, of obstetrical patients in clinical research. So able to track this in a proactive way, be able to make sure that any changes that need to happen are happening in real time. And this has been really successful, the enrollment in the studies as part of the MFM research program are really reflective of the overall obstetric population being delivered at Penn, seeing about 44% Black race, 11% Latinx, and 42% publicly insured on, or on Medicaid. And the Penn Shop group is really contributing to a larger consortium across the US recruiting over 30,000 pregnancies. The inclusion criteria is purposefully broad. We're recruiting anyone at less than 20 weeks gestation, both English and Spanish speaking. 
we have two visits during pregnancy, one at delivery, two during the first year of life, and then every year after that. And this first, this grant is for seven years. And so we expect the kids to get between three and four during this first, this first round. And we're really trying as much as possible to pair these visits with clinical care. We want to make this as easy as possible for potential participants and really trying to meet participants where they are. So we're working on getting an echo minivan with car seats so we can bring people in for their visits, we can offer home visits, and really trying to do all of the things that we can to recruit and retain people in the Pen Shop Echo cohort. And with that, we are very open to your ideas and your experiences in how best to recruit and retain participants. We are open to any and all ideas to make sure that we are able to retain these participants. And to do this takes a really big team. And this team has really brought together thought leaders across the institution and is really only possible through these collaborations between Penn and Shop. And I know that several of these faces are familiar to this audience and several of you are here today. Thank you for being here. Um, but wait, what may not be obvious from the pictures is the breadth and depth of the expertise that is brought by this team that spans multiple departments. So this is really an important collaboration between OBGYN and pediatrics and also the biostatistics, epidemiology, and informatics department. And the team brings important expertise in content, so in the environmental health areas, as well as these different outcomes, you know, maternal fetal medicine, pediatrics, asthma, neurodevelopment, also community engagement and health equity. And on the methods side, epidemiology, causal inference, machine learning, and data science, so that we can really be addressing these questions in thoughtful ways. And we are really grateful for key leadership support across OBGYN, pediatrics, and epidemiology that really has facilitated and made this made this possible. As you can imagine, we're recruiting 2,500 participants. This is a lot of space for a visit that needs to be coordinated and everyone has really worked together to facilitate this to make this possible. And we've also partnered with several community organizations and really broader pillars in the pen and shop communities like the Philadelphia Regional Center for Children's Environmental Health, who are really leading the way to improve children's health and support environmental justice and reduce health disparities. And we look forward to partnering, partnering with you. We are also partnering with the Center of Excellence in Environmental Toxicology. We are working closely with Dr. Marilyn Howarth, who is the director of the Community Engagement Corps. And the goal here is really to make sure that our community members' concerns are taken to the National ECHO Steering Committee, and the National ECHO level, and to be able to also disseminate findings from ECHO to our community and political leaders here. Also engaging with the Center for Health Equity at CHOP, and also the Research Institute Family Advisory Council to involve the community directly in this work. So we had our first meeting in February with, we met with eight community members who are all mothers of children under the age of two who would have been eligible for ECHO had the study been underway at Penn when they were pregnant. And this was my first experience with a meeting like this. A little embarrassed to say that that's, that was my first, first time, but it will definitely not be my last. It was such a wonderful experience to be able to discuss the study together, get their feedback on these pregnancy and home visits, how we can make this participation in the study as positive and participant focused as possible. And you know, we're really grateful for the feedback that they've provided so far. 
on retention strategies and resources for participants. And we, are, we have regular meetings scheduled and plan to meet with them. And as part of the Pen Shop Echo team, we really want to make sure that our approaches are informed by community-driven insights. So from you, from these community partners, because this will ultimately really enrich the quality and inclusivity of the research that we're doing. Here is a picture of our growing recruitment team. We've since added some more, some more members. We started recruitment on January 16th, and this team is incredible. They are so passionate and committed and so lucky to have them as part of Pen Shop Echo. This group is, they are the ones that are making this making this happen. And we have really made incredible progress so far. So we started, like I said, we started recruitment in the middle of January. And as of last night, we have enrolled 165 participants so far. And so we're really on track to meet our goal of 2,500 pregnant participants over three years of recruitment. And as I mentioned, Penn has an equity dashboard in place. The ECHO study is also tracking metrics to make sure that we are recruiting diverse populations. And we are consistently meeting, um, we're consistently able to recruit a diverse population, which we're really thrilled to be contributing to the larger ECHO cohort. We are just about to start our second pregnancy visits and are getting ready on the chop side for these babies to be born later this year. And so there's a lot going on and the team is making, making really incredible, incredible progress. And so we've been really focused on getting the study up and running and on recruiting and retaining the participants right now. But there are also already lots of opportunities to collaborate and innovate now. So a little bit of history about the project. So you may have heard of the National Children's Study, which NIH was trying to get off the ground for a long time. It didn't happen, but what happened was ECHO 1.0. So took all of the existing pregnancy and child cohorts in the US, kind of knit them together, harmonized the data in the best way possible, which you can imagine Everyone has their favorite diet questionnaire or stress questionnaire. So this harmonization process is definitely very challenging. But this data is now publicly available on DASH and includes over 63,000 participants. So a really incredible resource. And we have access to this as part of Pen Shop Echo. So please reach out if you would like to collaborate and use this data like I said, a really amazing resource. So we are a part of ECHO 2.0, which is involves this new pregnancy and child recruitment with a standardized protocol, which I think is a really important, important change from ECHO 1.0. And so we are collecting information across various domains to try and really understand various macro and micro environmental factors and all the child health outcomes. There is also opportunity to add additional measures. So there's the Opportunities and Innovation Fund for those who may be interested that we can add additional data collection. So there really are lots of opportunities and please reach out to us if, if you're interested in getting involved in, in any way. So I kind of want to move now into the second, the second half here. So really building off of the beginning where we talked about several of the different important questions that remain in this area. And as an epidemiologist, I'm kind of always thinking about what are the right methods that we can use to be able to address these important questions. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some methodological inter innovations that we have been applying in this work and how we plan to apply it in the ECHO cohort. 
So touch a little bit on mixtures, which I think this group is very familiar with, and also talk about causal inference methods, including dynamic treatment regimes and trial emulation. So in terms of mixtures, I think in the environmental space, this has really been more widely adopted, you know, using these methods to look at chemical exposures and air pollution. At least on the microenvironment side, these lifestyle factors, I'm not sure that it's been considered as in the same way as a mixture. Each of these exposures tends to usually be considered by itself. You know, you're looking at a dietary factor, you may adjust for physical activity or sleep, not really considering how these may be related. And so I think there's really an important next step to consider the totality of these exposures. And I think that there's room to do this in the mixtures context. context. It's not totally clear exactly how to do this. I think some of the methods that are being used right now for the chemicals and air pollution can potentially be applied in a similar way. Um, but just in thinking about this conceptually, you know, we can think about sleep, exercise, and sitting as the summation of a day. You know, and as we incorporate wearable technologies, it really gives us an opportunity to think about these whole day activities that may be dependent on one another. And we can also think about adding in dietary exposures, which I think dietary exposures themselves are really a mixtures problem. You know, and so when we think about the diet, activity, and sleep together, we have mixtures within mixtures. And I think that um, we need to start thinking about these exposures together. One way that we've started to do that is through applying causal inference methods for dynamic treatment regimes. And we did this to look at the effects of different lifestyle interventions for the prevention of pregnancy loss. And this work was led by a postdoc fellow in our group, Dr. Alexandra Produce mice who went on to be faculty at Brigham and Women's Hospital and is now in industry. And we have been able to look at different questions like, how many pregnancy losses could be prevented if women changed their exposure to smoking, alcohol, and caffeine? How early should women change their exposure to these factors? So are there these critical windows of development that might be important? And which interventions would require the fewest women to change their behavior? So which may be more likely to actually work in practice and be more feasible? So we define several hypothetical interventions in our study, starting with single interventions and then different combinations. So the first, what if we can get 100% of the smokers in our study to stop smoking? Same thing for alcohol intake and for caffeinated beverage intake. And then each of the combinations, what if we can you know, stop smoking and alcohol consumption, alcohol and caffeine, and then all three together. And we also considered the timing. So what if we are able to start these interventions at four weeks gestation? So this would be around the time of the earliest at-home pregnancy test. You find out you're pregnant, you initiate these interventions. What if we can't start that early? It can be really hard to start interventions that early in pregnancy. But what if we can do it at about seven weeks gestation, around a time of maybe an early ultrasound? Or what if we can start this intervention during the first trimester, so by 12 weeks gestation? And so we looked at each of these interventions. And so we'll kind of build this table, table together. So this first line is showing that the baseline risk of pregnancy loss is about 23%. And we'll be looking at both the risk ratios and the risk differences. And include the average percent intervened on. Like I said, this is to get at this measure of feasibility. How practical might this intervention, intervention be? 
And then we started by evaluating each of these single interventions. So first, what if we're able to get 100% of the participants to quit drinking alcohol at four weeks gestation? We see that the risk of pregnancy loss goes down to about 20.6%. So we see a reduction of risk of about 12%. And it only required about 5% of individuals to change their behavior in an average week. Looking at smoking, we see very similar results. We see about an 8% reduction in pregnancy loss. And for caffeine, about a 10% reduction in loss. And perhaps not surprisingly, this would require more individuals to change their, change their behavior in an average week. So next we looked at these combinations of interventions. And you can see that the combined interventions were associated with even greater reductions in pregnancy loss. So about 15 to 17% reduction in pregnancy loss. And when we look at all three together, we see the most reduction in loss, about 23% reduction in pregnancy loss. And when looking at the risk differences, we see about five pregnancy losses a reduction in about five pregnancy losses per 100 pregnancies. And this required about 22% of individuals to change their behavior on a given week. So this is really highlighting the potential importance of considering multiple exposures together and the added benefit of these joint interventions. But what if we couldn't initiate them that early on? What if we can initiate these interventions in about seven weeks? So this table is set up in a similar way. And you can see that there are still reductions in the risk of pregnancy loss for the single intervention. That is more if you're able to do the joint intervention. But it's all attenuated, right? The estimates are a lot weaker. So for if we're able to intervene on all three, here we see about an 11% reduction in pregnancy loss, whereas if we're able to start it earlier, we could see about a 23% decrease in risk. And if we initiate a 12 weeks gestation, so here we're seeing virtually no benefit in terms of reducing the risk of pregnancy loss. And this probably makes, I think this makes sense, especially for the outcome of pregnancy loss because the losses are happening throughout this time. So by the time you get to 12 weeks gestation, most of the losses have already occurred. And so you're not really gonna see the benefit of these interventions that start later, it's just too late. Um, but there may still be benefits for other pregnancy outcomes. So we could use similar approaches to look at other outcomes as well. And so in going back to the key questions, we found that about five pregnancy losses per 100 pregnancies could have been prevented under this joint intervention on caffeine, smoking, and alcohol. And when thinking about the timing of the intervention, really here earlier is better to minimize the risk of pregnancy loss. So again, highlighting the importance of thinking about these critical windows of exposure. And in terms of which interventions require the fewest women to change their usual exposure, we found that alcohol abstinence was associated with the strongest risk reduction of any of the single interventions, uh, with about 2.8 fewer losses per 100 pregnancies, while requiring the fewest women to change their behavior in an average week. And I think that we could think about ways to apply these similar sorts of methods to the macroenvironmental factors, to think about improving green space and walkability, and also thinking about air pollution. We could think about similar interventions. I also have been really curious about extending this to other microenvironment or lifestyle factors so thinking about exercise, sleep, and diet. 
So we're seeing these potential benefits of the smoking, alcohol, and caffeine interventions. But what about these other lifestyle factors? And using wearables, we can, you know, think about defining even more detailed interventions with that detailed daily data. And our goal is really, we want to be able to identify specific optimal components of the microenvironment, things like diet, activity, and sleep, whether it's by themselves or jointly, to really improve child health outcomes and reduce the disparities that we see in these neonatal and child health outcomes. And also to be considering within specific macro environmental contexts, taking into account green space walkability and air pollution. And here we have been doing this by applying a trial emulation approach. So this really allows us to frame research questions in a way that will be highly translatable to clinical practice and to guidelines. And when we think about trials in this area, you know, ideally a randomized trial would involve randomizing pregnant people to this combined intervention, you know, meeting the guidelines for a healthy diet, for exercise and sleep compared to no intervention. But when I hear about this randomized trial, I'm like that sounds very nice, but that would never happen, right? Randomized trials of lifestyle interventions are really, really challenging. And I think this applies to not only the micro environment for lifestyle interventions, but also the macro environmental factors as well. It's really hard to determine what the intervention itself should be. So which lifestyle factors should we focus on? What's the right duration, the intensity, can we have a sample size large enough to detect what are usually modest effects? And if we're interested in preconception, these critical windows, we tend to need even larger studies. So if we're looking at a preconception cohort, only part of them will get pregnant and even fewer will have pregnancy complications. And so the sample sizes get small pretty quickly. There's also a lot of non-compliance. These studies on diet and activity are notorious for non-compliance. can also be challenging to determine the best population to study and to recruit a generalizable and diverse population. And these trials can take years to complete. And it would be near impossible to really do a lifestyle intervention trial to compare all of the factors that we would want to vary or to do it with a big enough sample size. And particularly for the macro environmental factors, it just may not be ethical to think about randomizing people and doing some of these as a randomized trial. And so trial emulation really gives us an opportunity to use observational data to address these really important causal questions to guide public health and medical decision makers and have translatable findings. So what is the target trial? So for each question that we want to answer, causal effect that we want to estimate, we can think about a hypothetical randomized experiment to, uh, to quantify it. And this is what we mean by the target trial. So it's probably a trial that you would never actually do, but if you had all the money and resources what is the trial that you would like to do? And then we use observational data to emulate the target trial. So really trying to figure out what randomized experiment we're trying to emulate. And this involves going through each of the components of the target trial protocol. So just like you were designing a randomized trial that you intended to carry out, you do the same thing in the target trial setting. So think in detail about eligibility criteria, the interventions, the start and end of follow-up, the outcomes of interest, and the causal contrast and statistical analysis. And of course, a key challenge is emulating that randomization. So if we want to 
emulate the trial, we need to be able to come as close as possible to emulating randomization. And that means being able to measure and adjust for confounding. So we need to make sure we're gathering data and adjusting for all the potential confounding factors so that we can achieve this balance between our exposed and unexposed groups like we would get if we were to use randomization. And I find it really helpful, and you'll see this in the target trial emulation papers that have been published, that there is usually this table that really lays out what this target trial looks like and how it can be emulated in the observational data. So really stepping through each of those components of the target trial. So first, eligibility criteria. We can think about this lifestyle intervention trial we want to do. We could recruit all pregnant individuals prior to 20 weeks gestation. But how exactly do we want to define these interventions? So we've been thinking about, about this a lot and first turn to the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. So these guidelines include 13 components, which are listed here, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, dairy. And we can look to see if people in our data set are meeting these recommendations. And we looked at this in a large multi-site pregnancy cohort in the U.S. of singleton pregnancies. And you can see the percent adherence on the right-hand column. It varies quite a bit, right? Only 1% of pregnant people are meeting the guidelines for whole grains. But up to 79% are meeting the guidelines for whole fruit. So there's definitely the potential to improve diet quality here. But we were thinking about these guidelines and how we might want to think about some different interventions. And so we came up with five potential hypothetical interventions. The first is an intervention to increase adherence to the recommendations to meet at least seven of the 13 components. So maybe you don't meet all of them, but if we can do an intervention and get individuals to meet at least seven components. A second intervention might be, let's do an intervention and focus on meeting the total fruit and vegetable recommendations. The third uh, focuses on the recommendations for the moderation component, so really limiting foods and beverages that are high in added sugars and saturated fat and sodium. Another possible intervention could be three meals per day, no skipping of meals. And the fifth one that we were thinking about was to look at the level of processed food and to reduce the frequency of ultra processed food intake to less than 40% of the total dietary intake. And here we're considering comparing them to the natural course, which just means we're gonna let people do what they do, no changes in diet, and be able to consume their usual, usual diet. So those were some potential interventions on the diet side. For physical activity and sleep, we also referred to the existing guidelines, which recommend 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity aerobic activity and to get at least seven hours of sleep per night. And then if we want to add diet into this, you know, we can think about adding in the optimal diet from the previous set that we were looking at and to look at a joint strategy that includes all three. So these are some potential ways to think about intervention strategies and we could use these for our target trial. For the trial, we would randomize to a treatment strategy and enrollment before 20 weeks gestation. And then the follow-up would be from enrollment through delivery and for the child outcomes through age three. And we're really focused on the outcomes of abnormal fetal growth, preterm birth, obesity, asthma, and neurodevelopmental delays by age three. And next, thinking about the analysis phase, 
So just like in the randomized trial setting, we usually think about intent to treat effects and for protocol effects. So here, the intent to treat effect would be I'm randomizing you to one of these lifestyle strategies, a baseline, and then we're not worrying about your adherence after that. Whereas the per protocol effect would then be accounting for the compliance over follow-up. And so now that we've defined this, this overall trial, we can also think about potential interventions within macro environmental context. So we can block randomize to look at the effects of these interventions in subgroups. So we want to look at those who do and do not live in a highly walkable neighborhood, those who do and do not have access to green space, and who do and do not live in a highly polluted area. And so now that we have the target trial protocol, we can think about how we would emulate that using the observational data. We would use similar eligibility criteria of prior to 20 weeks gestation. We'd be looking at the same intervention strategies. The randomized assignment, here is where we need to emulate the randomization by adjusting for important confounding factors like age, education, BMI, marital status. And we would use a similar follow-up looking at the same outcomes and also interested in estimating both intent to treat and per protocol effects. And here we are adjusting for confounding and using per protocol analyses that utilize G methods to account for time varying confounding and compliance over the follow-up period. And in terms of the interactions with the macro environment, we're treating this in the same way and achieving balance by modeling and weighting methods. And so we utilized an existing large, diverse, multi-site pregnancy cohort to start to look at some of these interventions proposed on the risks of preterm birth and SGA. And this particular cohort was a pretty low risk cohort. And so the preterm birth rate was only 6%, the SGA only 9%, but still, we saw really pronounced disparities, racial disparities in these outcomes. So we started by looking at interventions that would require adherence to six or seven of those dietary components from the guidelines. And we see that they are associated with reductions in preterm and SGA. And you know, if you're able to do seven as compared to six dietary components, there's an even greater reduction. But these risk ratios are pretty imprecise, given the smaller sample size and low prevalence of the outcome. So our confidence intervals are pretty wide, but we're seeing some, some trends here. We also looked at the fruit and vegetable recommendations, see some potential hints of reduced risk, not as much going on with the moderation components. When we look at physical activity, we're not seeing much, but meeting the sleep recommendations may lower the risk of preterm birth somewhat. And when we start to look at various combinations of the joint interventions, we see, like before, even greater reductions. But again, these are really imprecise. We do see that physical activity and sleep together may be associated with reduced risk of preterm birth, which I think is really interesting because each one individually had either no effect or much smaller effects, but it really seems to be the importance of looking at these joint interventions together. And we see the greatest reductions when looking at sleep and adherence to more than seven dietary components. So our next steps are really to look at this with the ECHO data. So we have really imprecise estimates. We need a much bigger sample size, which we're really excited to be able to look at this with the ECHO data. And this will also enable us to extend this to look within the macro environmental context so we can tease apart these different combinations. 
And these methods, these causal inference methods, can really help us address solution-oriented questions of maternal and child health. And our results here really suggest the potential benefits of considering these exposures together and the importance of looking at these critical windows of development and looking early in pregnancy and even preconception. And overall, the PenChop ECHO cohort really represents a massive investment by NIH in environmental and perinatal health research here at Penn and Chop. And this investment allows for inclusion of a diverse study sample. Our health system serves a population which tends to be underrepresented in other pregnancy and pediatric cohorts. And so it's really important that we have this diverse cohort. We also have opportunities to identify actionable health promoting and health protecting environments. I mean, the point of this work is to be able to identify potential solutions and we are hoping to be able to do that. And as I showed, we're actively working on new methods to be able to address these important questions. And this really elevates the visibility of pen and shop within this growing field as climate change really threatens our nation's and world's health. And I really think that Penn and Shop is the ideal place to innovate in the field of maternal and child health equity. And so we know that environments matter for health. And we, our goal really with Penn Shop Echo is to shed light on the extent to which health inequities are related to environmental exposures. There are a lot of questions that remain and a lot of work to be done in this area. And this has the potential to benefit not only our own institutional and neighborhood communities, but also communities across the country. And I want to thank you for inviting me. And again, please reach out. We would love to collaborate and work with all of you because this, yeah, we need, we need your help and your expertise.